All right, if I hit function F11, I can see my desktop. If I open up my folder and go into exercise one, I have assets. I can see all my assets. And I've decided I want to get one that's like a little different than what I have. Even though I already have more than five, I want five that I really like. So I went to Google image search. I'm doing large black and white line drawing. This time I'm not going to limit it to Creative Commons because I want you to just always assume anything that's on a Google search is copyrighted because it's really hard to, to find things that aren't when you dig down. So, so I'm just going to do all kinds of licenses. And then I'll see lots of variations, right? Not all of these are what I'm looking for. But this kind of thing is kind of what I'm looking for. The Mayan glyphs, they're, they're kind of, they're alphabet pictographs that are all based on different, uh, very often different animals or different symbols, kind of like hieroglyphics. So I like this quite a bit. I'm going to open the image in a new tab because this is Google and I want to make sure that it's high quality. This is very high quality. It's around more than 2,000 pixels. I'm going to drag that onto the desktop. See if there's any others that I want to use that just match with my taste for the kind of line art. Like this is beautiful, but because it's from YouTube, I'm guessing it's just screen resolution. It's pretty good, 900 by 900. So if I open that image in a new tab, I can see it at full size. Yeah, that might be useful. So I'll take that one too. Okay, at this point, it's stealing images. How do we turn it into making them our own, making it original? Because I'm going to move them all into my assets folder. And now I'm going to pick the five I actually want to use. So I really like this one. I marked it green. Let's see. I really like this one that I just found. I think this one could be interesting because this is a mix of line art and full bleed inking, like these big black shapes. But it's not so solid that it's, I think it will give a nice variation. They're like thick lines. So I'm going to mark that orange. These are kind of my secondary choices. I like this one a lot. So that's four. And then I think aspects of this one could be interesting. And it's a really high quality one because that's from, from Pixabay. I, there are aspects I like of the others, but those are the, the five I'm going to go for. Okay, now, why I like giving them colors when I search is that then you can view them based on their tags. So that's the one I'm going to start with, and then these are the four I'm going to support with. Right? So how do I get started? Just like it says in the directions, once I have my assets, I go to photop.com. I don't ever need you to create an account with PhotoP. You can if you like. It will kind of remember your work within some limited parameters if you create an account. And they are free. You can also pay for accounts. But I'm just going to use it without ever even signing in. And it's a very, very functional, helpful program. You'll notice I do not have ads. And PhotoP is funded by side scrolling ads and I do that with ad blocking software because I don't like to make YouTubes that then have someone else's ads in them and I make my YouTube's Creative Commons open with no ads so it's not a revenue generating channel but if I open this in PhotoP these are the things I want you to pay attention to it will tell you in the lower right uh, lower left hand corner what your pixel dimensions are the problem is, those might not be the actual pixel dimensions we want for our project. So, before we drag and drop and open it in PhotoP, we want to create a canvas size that's at least 8 by 10 inches. And then we want to create a resolution that's at least 300 pixels per inch. So there's a, a bunch of ways we can do that. We can modify from our original image. 
but in many ways, an easier way is to just open up PhotoP and then say new project. And then you get to set up the pixel grid that you're going to bring your images into. So this new project, I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to give it my name and then a description. Whenever we save a file in this class, you're going to start with your name and then a description. So I'm going to say exercise number one, and it's going to be a Mayan line art jumble, something like that. You could say cartoon jumble, whatever you want. Now, where it says width and height, I'm going to change it from being pixels to being inches, because we're talking about the actual output size that we're going to print. And we want this to be a minimum of 8 by 10 inches. If you want to go larger, you can. I wouldn't go larger than 11 by 14. Okay, so I'm going to do 8 by 10 inches. But that's not the end of it. Because 8 by 10 inches is what's called a physical dimension. We want the pixel dimension. So we have to say how many pixels is it going to fit within each inch. And that's what's called pixel resolution. It's weird to me because PhotoP is a really good, well-researched program. But they say DPI here. And then they contradict themselves by calling it pixels per inch. DPI is an old term for pixels per inch. Now DPI is used for printers, and it stands for dots per inch. But pixels are not dots, right? So PPI is the term we'll use, and we want a minimum of 300 pixels per inch. But when we're in the studio and we have good quality reference, which I do, we're going to use our studio resolution, which is 350. 300 is the standard minimum for print. That means it does not look like professional printing if it's less than 300 pixels per inch. 350 is our studio standard because it allows us to print it a little bit bigger than we might have thought we wanted to print it at the end of the day. Now, if you would have seen it, it happened really, really quickly, and it's super annoying. So now we're going to go to image, image size. And what it did is once I put in 350, it converted it back into a smaller size, like almost imperceptibly. This is because we are using PhotoP servers here. <laughs> and the more pixels we ask it to use, the, the more it costs for them, right? In general, it costs around, I think it's 46 cents for each average PhotoP file. And we're not paying anything, right? So. What I'm going to do is now force it up to 8 by 10 inches again. So that's a little shortcut it has to like make things screen resolution rather than print resolution. And now it will remember. And why does that matter? Because if you look in the lower left-hand corner, now you'll see that it's in the multiples of thousands. So we're, we're looking at a canvas size that's around 2,800 by 300 or 3,500 3, pixels. And if I go to image size again, it will show us 8 by 10 by 350. So that's what we want. Once we have that, we can drag and drop our favorite image on. And when you do that, it comes in with what's called a transforming box. If the native image is bigger than the canvas size we brought it in, it's just going to fill the image. right? We'll squeeze it on. But with this transforming box, that allows us to immediately scale it and to rotate it by clicking on the corners or outside of the corner. And if I right click inside the transform box, I'll get more options. My favorite being warp, where I can push and pull it like it's rolling cookie dough. I am not creating my own lines. I'm just modifying existing pixels into what I want. I can also right click inside it and flip it horizontally or vertically. Now, you'll notice that these blue lines will not go away until you hit return. So all of this is preliminary in the transform box until you hit return. So a lot of you are going to ask over and over again, which makes sense. This is a main skill we're learning. How can I change the size or distort my image? You do that by going up to edit and free transform. We call this transforming. The shortcut for it is a little bit burdensome. It's easier in Photoshop. In Photoshop, it's just Command-T. But in Photo-P, if you hit Command-T, 
it will open up a new tab in your browser, right? So you have to add the option key in photo key in photo p for for transforming so it's option command t and then it will give you a transform box so select the layer then hit option command t and you'll get that transform box that allows you to edit it and for more options than just scaling and rotating right click within it and you can do lots of other stuff warp is my favorite and then hit return after now I'll bring in my next one, this one. And this is an odd one, right? As soon as I bring it in, it will fill the screen and then it will give me the transform box and I can start using it immediately. And I can right click and I can warp. I can stretch it in different ways. Black line art's very, very flexible. But I wanna keep everything within my eight by 10. I don't want anything to go off the edges. So something that's really rectilinear like this, I can use warp and distort and skew, you know, to, to make it work a little bit more with my jumble aesthetic. Now, what I just brought in was a JPEG element. JPEG does not have empty space, right? It's white and black pixels. So naturally, layering it on top of what was underneath, it covered it up. But what if I don't want it to cover up? What I can do is change my blending mode to, from normal to multiply. And that will only let the dark pixels come through. And so that will really start to jumble up the line art. And you can see already with just two layers, it's getting pretty busy. So before I add more, I'm going to show you how you can start to take away from these layers. And we can do that once we know we have the right resolution, we're going to right click on the layer and we're going to say rasterize. That will take away the little smart object icon that's in the, the layer window. And when we try to use our lasso to erase it, it won't give us this warning that it has to be rasterized first. So we have to rasterize it by right clicking and rasterize. Now, I can go in, just like Arturo Herrera deletes the, the faces of the dwarves, I can go in and say, I like some aspects of this, but I don't really love this part, and then just delete it. Right. Or I can say, I don't want the eyes of this one. And I, I want you to be pretty brave about this. It doesn't need to be super clean or super controlled. I want you, like you're using an X-Acto knife, and you're just getting rid of stuff as though it was all copyrighted and we have to hide what the original was. That's part of transforming it. I don't really want this hand and foot. Okay, okay now let's bring in some more. But there's a worry now. Now I have three distinct layers. I have a blank white background layer. I have multiple layers. What happens if I lose my internet connection? Start over. I have to start all over because I haven't saved anything, right? Even though I gave it a name, it's not saved anywhere. So at this point, before I add more, it's a good idea to click on File and then Save as PSD. That will give you an opportunity to change your name if it's not named correctly. Mine's named correctly. And it will give you the opportunity to save it to the desktop. We always want to save to the desktop because then we can verify that it's saved. So if it's navigating to anywhere else, you can always just hit Command D when we get to this search option for saving and then save. And then you hit Function Key F11 and you'll see it. There it is. And I'm just going to leave it on the desktop as I'm working on it. Okay. Now my work is backed up, at least in one place, and I can bring in this other stuff. Like this one. I can transform it. Maybe I leave this one just at an angle, and I flip it. I kind of liked actually where it was. Like that. 
And maybe I just warp it a little bit just to fit it on. 